next speaker is Hannah Mermelstein, who's an active member of Adala New York, the New York Campaign for the Boycott of Israel. Hannah is also the co-founder of Birthright Unplugged and the co-founder of Students Boycott Apartheid. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the organizers and my co-panelists and to everyone who's here. I want to start by just bringing us back to the Palestinian call for BDS because I think that that should be our reference point when talking in this discussion and in the movement in general. So just to reiterate the three demands of the Palestinian civil society call from 2005, it was an end to the occupation um, that's of West Bank, Gaza Strip, East Jerusalem, Golan Heights, and dismantling of the wall. Um, Right, equal rights for Palestinian citizens of Israel, and right of return for Palestinian refugees. So those are the three demands. And I think that the call was really significant for a few different reasons. One, it's a Palestinian-led movement. It's not imposed from the outside, it's, it's Palestinian. Another is that it's rights-based rather than solution-based. So what that means is it's not about one state, two states, 10 states, and there are a variety of opinions within the BDS movement about that, but it's really about the rights of the people who live in that area. And then finally, it's unifying. It's a unifying call. The vast majority of Palestinian civil society organizations everywhere across the political spectrum and across the globe, uh, geographically, have signed on to this. So we often hear things like, most Palestinians support this or that. Um, there are polls all the time, and whether you believe polls in general or not, even these polls are at best most people within West Bank and Gaza, which represents only a third of the Palestinian people. So if we really want to include all Palestinian people, if we want to include Palestinian citizens of Israel, if we want to include Palestinian refugees who are a majority of the Palestinian people, we, we can't go by these polls, we can't go by the PA, as you've said, the PA has indicated maybe that it would be willing to give up some Palestinian rights. It's, it's true. They have indicated that. The PA is not representative, however, of all Palestinian people, and it's not representative of civil society, and that's why the civil society call came out. Um, so I think the people who are most directly affected are the people who need to be included in the movement and in any negotiations, at any negotiating table. So I know that a lot of people, particularly Jewish American people, feel some fear around Palestinian demands for justice. And I want to talk about that for a minute, and specifically about the right of return for Palestinian refugees. Um, you know, people often hear right of return and they think it means throw the Jews into the sea. But where does this fear come from and where do we go with it? And I think too many in the Jewish American community close ourselves off and sort of turn inward and turn away from some of our core values, ultimately harming everybody. Now, for me personally, I understand the need for safe space for oppressed communities. Um, whether it's groups of friends, events, organizations, I get it. I haven't personally felt my Jewish identity very threatened much in my life, luckily, other than occasionally by other Jews and Israelis. Um, but as a woman, as a queer person, I get the need for safe space but I don't feel the need or desire to create an entire country based on the protection for one particular group of people. I want to work to make, make my community safe for everybody. But I, again, I understand the impetus even to go to that degree. For me, the minute that it loses all legitimacy is when that takes away from the protection, safety, and security of another group of people. So, So when you talk about a Jewish state in a land where the vast majority of the indigenous population is not Jewish, that requires anti-democratic practices. It requires ongoing oppression, and that's what we've seen for decades. So I think people come to terms with this in different ways. And for me, it happened when I was in Palestine in the West Bank refugee camp of Dehesha in Bethlehem, and just talking to my host mother and, and a host family there. And she was talking with such love and pride about her village of Zakaria. Um, but she's in her 40s. She's younger than the state of Israel. She's never lived in her village that she very much considers her village that her parents are from. And I, as an American Jew with no familial ties to the area, could fly across the world tomorrow and get full citizenship rights on her land in her village, which is called Zakaria, was called Zakaria, is now called Zacharia in Hebrew. And I could live there in a house on her land, and she, who lives 20 miles away, is not allowed to visit. That, for me, is sort of when it clicked. And that's not an anomaly. That 
is what it means to have a Jewish state in Israel, Palestine, call it what you will. And I say this because I think it's a major stumbling block for Jewish people and Jewish American people in supporting Palestinian-led movements. So I want to challenge you today to assume for a moment that when Palestinians talk about the right of return, it doesn't mean throw the Jews into the sea. It's a simple articulation of a basic human right that applies to all people, not only Palestinians, all people. And also to take at face value the BDS movement when it says they were anti-racist politics. When they say they are committed to fighting against racism against all people, believe that, including racism against Jews. So BDS is not a threat to Jews. It's actually an invitation to true solidarity. So the way I personally responded to this invitation is by joining Adala New York, the New York campaign for the boycott of Israel. And I just want to make the discussion a little more concrete, my part of the discussion a little more concrete now by talking about a couple of our campaigns within Adala New York. So we're perhaps best known for our boycott of Israeli diamond manufacturer and settlement builder Lev Lebayev. Um, now our first public action was at the opening of his diamond store in Madison Ave um, three years ago, November 2007, which prompted a New York Post article stating, Susan Sarandon will cross a picket line if there are diamonds on the other side. She was there at the opening. Now, so right away there was press, but even this, our first public action came with a lot of work. And that's what we do within Adala New York. We're often, we're known for our public creative actions that I think are really important to have in any movement. But we also do a lot of really diligent research to make sure our targets are focused, our campaigns are focused, and that we're effective. So ultimately, the campaign against the Viv is not a consumer boycott. I don't know about you, but I don't buy diamonds on a daily basis. <laughs> so, it, and Kathleen mentioned that a lot of the BDS movement is not necessarily at this moment about economic impact, and I would agree with that. And it is about moral legitimacy, and Israel thrives in moral legitimacy, and that's what we need to challenge, is the legitimacy of occupation and oppression. And so, over the past few years, we've gotten Oxfam, UNICEF, CARE, and even the British government to disassociate from Leviev. The Norwegian, Swedish, and Dutch governments have all um, divested from Africa Israel, Leviev's flagship company. Major celebrities have quietly taken their names and pictures off of his website. And just last week, we had a major success in which Africa Israel, his com Leviev's company, announced that they are no longer involved in or have any plans to be involved in settlement construction. Now, this was a huge success, and they, of course, claimed it was not a political decision, but it's a response to our the other campaign I want to briefly mention, um, in contrast to, or perhaps complement to, our long-term campaign against Leviev, is a series of what in New York has been more short-term campaigns around cultural boycott. Um, and this is campaigns targeting both Israeli cultural institutions that are coming to New York, as well as um, American and other international performers going to Israel. And just to give one recent example, the Bat Sheva Dance Company um, was here performing at the Joyce Theater. And um, Bat Sheva is one of Israel's major dance companies. They've expressed, um, you know, they've expressed pride in being an ambassador of Israel. They've never denounced Israeli policies of occupation and oppression. And they receive money from the Israeli government not only for their ongoing activities, which is totally legitimate, Israel should be funding the arts in Israel, but they receive money for their tours um, around the world as part of this Israeli government campaign called Brand Israel that has its, as its explicit goal to use arts and culture to bring a more positive image to Israel in the face of declining world popularity. So in other words, to cover up Israeli crimes rather than to end them. So we stood out the, outside the Joyce Theater, dancing, singing, chanting, leafleting, and talking to people, and inviting them to a cultural boycott discussion that we held the following week, led by Palestinian dancers. Um, and this is really in the spirit of BDS, which is a spirit of engagement. People often claim that it's to kind of shut down dialogue. It's not. It really opens up the space, I think, to have these conversations. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about cultural boycott in particular. A lot of people think it's targeting all Israeli individuals. It's not. It's an institutional boycott. Um, so we wanted to kind of bring these things to light by having a public event. So we did that. But, you know, we were outside Bat Sheva the week before when they were performing, and um, one of the most moving moments there was when one of the um, dance goers gave up his ticket to one of my colleagues saying, I can't go in now. I don't, I won't enjoy it. I don't want to go in. So when we talk about effectiveness, we talk about this man giving up his ticket. We talk about the many really respectful and in-depth conversations I had with folks who, were, who actually did end up going in, but now that conversation is out there and they're thinking about these things. 
We talk about the public forum that we had on cultural boycott the following week in a packed room. And we talk about the write-up we got in the New York Times art section. So if New York Times journalists feel like when they're writing now about an Israeli dance performance in New York, that they have to mention us, that they mention the cultural boycott, we must be doing something right. Now, before I end, I just want to remind everybody, remind us, that we on this panel here are all Jews. And I think it's really important for us to have this discussion to talk about who we are um, in the movement. Uh, but ultimately, it's not up to us to decide how Palestinian people conduct their struggle for freedom. So I just want to express my immense gratitude to all the Palestinian people who have created and joined this incredibly principled BDS movement and who have invited and welcomed us, Jews, Americans, and everyone into the struggle.